This year is super special for Intuit. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary. So please, um, if you can join us for our visionary ball in June, please do if you can come visit us and celebrate with us. 30 really wonderful years of this institution. We'd love um, to greet you and to say the hello. Uh, Joshua, um, our presenter today, is someone who has volunteered uh, for many years at Intuit and has been part of our world and our everyday life here. And one of the really wonderful things about One Night Stand and our online programming is that um, we are able to um, share the spotlight and share the floor with many people who are in our Intuit circle. Um, and they can share the things that they love about self-taught and outsider art. And tonight we're gonna get to see that. Um, any comments or any observations you make, please use the chat. We'll be looking at that and Joshua uh, will have you know questions and things for you. So uh, yes, go ahead, Joshua, it's all you now. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, my name is Joshua Willis and I am a gallery associate here at Intuit. Just one moment. I'm getting this set up. Just one moment. It's been quite a while since I've given a, a slideshow uh, presentation. It's probably been since college. All right. Okay. So I'm going to start share screening again. All right. Okay, so as I said, my name is Joshua. I'm a gallery associate here at uh, Intuit. I am a transplant to the Chicago area. Um, I'm originally from rural Georgia, which in my unbiased opinion um, is home to the greatest self-taught art in the world. Um, Georgia has a particularly strong uh, tradition of artist built environments. I'm sure many of you and many other um, outsider art fans can name at least uh, one or two of the most famous ones being uh, Howard Finster's Paris Gardens, as well as St. Ohm's Passapuan. Um, these are rec recently getting a lot more well-deserved attention. Um, and in fact, last year we had someone, uh, Frank Bagone, do two wonderful one-night stands on each site for Intuit. Um, the state's also home to many other uh, less known and less celebrated environments by artists who, uh, unlike Finster and St. Ohm, um, often tend to be uh, women or, and or people of color, um, such as James Double Dutch Kimball, uh, Floria Yancey, Laura, Por Laura, Laura Pope Forrester, and the subject of today's conversation, Ulysses Davis. So before we tackle the work, I want to give some biographical context for Davis. Um, he was born in 1914 or 1913, the date's a little murky, um, in the railroad town of Fitzgerald, Georgia. Um, Fitzgerald is located in the southern part of the state. Um, it's rather unusual for southern towns in that it was actually founded by a Midwestern former drummer boy um, as a community for Civil War soldiers, um, both Union and Confederate. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, reconciliation between the, between the two former enemies have become increasingly popular. Um, as you can see in the name of the town's Grand Hotel, the Lee Grant Hotel, um, which was named after both Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee. Um, at best, this reconciliation was done by glossing over or downplaying the racial issues central to the conflict decades before, or you know, at worst, they were united in the shared cause of white supremacy and anti-Black racism. So in 1900, um, five, five years after its founding, Fitzgerald was essentially a sundown town, and this was the world Davis was born into. Uh, one of five children, uh, Davis left the school at the age of fourth grade to support his family. Um, he trained as a railroad blacksmith, a job that he held for, uh, for many years. And in his youth, he whittled, um, which was then a common pastime. He created small sculptures from firewood, all which, all, almost all of which were later burned out of necessity. 
And in 1942, uh, David and his family moved to Savannah, uh, one of Georgia's largest cities and home to a vibrant black community that existed despite the disenfranchisement and repression of, the, of Jim Crow racism. And by the 1950s, um, car, car, owners, car ownership and interstate travel had exploded, um, essentially, you know, sealing the death of the uh, then uh, of the railroads. And so Davis was let go um, from his job by the um, Seaboard Airline Railroad. And he possessed a talent for cutting hair uh, from his youth. And so he decided to open up a barber shop as barbering was one of the few um, careers available to a black man in the South at the time. It was also a bit of an artistic outlet as being a barber is both, you know, as, as, much, of, is as much of an art as it is a trade. And in addition to um, cutting hair, um, you'll see a barber shop as it was known had a small space used for restoring old furniture and a carving area. And over the next four decades, Davis decorated his shop with around 300 sculptures. Um, sometimes he carved these during the slow, slow down times at the shop. And they ranged in scale from six inches to over 40 inches. And I consider Davis to be an art environment builder um, though he tended to create primarily for the interior as opposed to the exterior, like many other builders. Um, but the works were created um, in a very specific context. They were site specific um, and they were, a kind of a, they were a cohesive whole, um, as you can see in this photograph from 1900, around the time of Davis's retirement and his subsequent death. And though the works are united, they do range in subject matter and theme. Um, these themes can be put into several different categories. Um, many, uh, many of Davis's most important works um, reflect his deep Christian faith, um, as seen in his largest work created over four, 40 inches tall. Um, and that is this crucifix that was carved out of uh, extensive cedar in the 1940s, um, as, a, as in Davis's words, uh, nothing was too good for Jesus. Um, and despite being a black man in the uh, Jim Crow South, he was fervently a uh, patriotic man. And Davis's most famous work is um, perhaps a set of 52 busts of all the US presidents up to that time, all the way up to George H.W. Bush. And as an aside, I wanna say I really love this uh, portrait of Teddy Roosevelt, as it really gives a good idea of Davis's talent at incorporating foul material um, both for decoration um, and to add realism, as well as a, a bit of, you know, a touch of humor as well. He also created a portrait bust of other historical figures, such as James Oglethorpe, the man who founded Georgia, um, as well as the contemporary leaders of the civil rights movement, um, including Martin Luther King Jr., who you see here. And by the 70s, um, Davis had began incorporating overt African motifs in his work. Uh, he claimed he was inspired by an Anheuser Bush uh, advertisement of the great African kings and queens. Um, but this is also keeping in time with the ethos of the um, era's black power and arts movements. Um, and that, you know, that led to a renewed interest uh, for many black Americans in their African roots. Um, but instead of reproducing one culture's art, um, these works instead tend to synthesize um, elements from various African cultures into a, a kind of Africanized aesthetic. And there's another category, and this one's definitely my favorite, um, and that is his fantastical creatures, uh, which brings us to today's object. So Davis, he usually worked from reality or from pre-existing source materials, whether this be historical or religious. Um, but these were, were completely from his imagination and he let it run riot. Um, and you can really see the drama and whimsy of uh, Davis's best work here. And so I've been going on and on for a while. So I think I'm gonna set back and open up the floor. Um, we can all, I want to invite everyone to do a close reading here or a close look at the piece and provide any and all uh, impressions that you may have. I know it's hard to get an idea of a sculpture from a photograph, but I hope this gives an idea of how it looks in the round. So what are some of the details that you notice? 
Um, what does this animal look like to you? Um, does it look like any animal? Right, we have some chats here. Let's see. Um, it is an interesting um, pedestal structure. Yes, yeah, so Davis, uh, many of his pieces do have this kind of uh, presentation or uh, mount already uh, incorporated into them. And this goes back to his earliest works. Uh, one of his earliest works is the 1930s, 1940s Statue of Liberty, which includes, of course, the famous uh, pedestal that the statue is on in New York. And, uh, and it, this is, you know, a creature completely from Davis's mind. It does not exist in real life. But I do think it's interesting that we can kind of see some various elements from real life existing animals, perhaps ones that, you know, Davis was perhaps, you know, even familiar with in his day-to-day -day life. So I also want to, uh, you know, touch upon uh, the practice of that Davis's work and how he created these kinds of sculptures. Um, so uh, Davis was a very modest man, keeping in tune with his, you know, his deep, you know, faith. Uh, but until he, he never referred to himself as an artist, instead saying he was a whittler. Um, this is not strictly, stri strictly accurate. As opposed to a whittler, um, he used a variety of tools besides his trusty pocket knife, uh, many of which he actually created himself using the skill that he had learned as a blacksmith. And to create a sculpture, he would first select a piece of wood, and these he gathered you know, from the wood surrounding him, um, other pieces that were from scrap, from lumber yards, or even a local banjo maker. And for the most important works, he would instead use uh, exotic wood such as cedar or mahogany and he's got these from his friends at the savannah dockyards uh, for example the crucifix we saw um, also in this series of president's busts um, all are made of mahogany except for one and that's james buchanan who is often regarded as perhaps the uh, worst u.s president due to his uh, inability to steer america from the civil war and so perhaps this was kind of a sly commentary on uh, david davis's part um, but so he would, for many years, he would take the piece of wood, um, he would hatch it to reduce its mass, and then refine the shape with the chisel before smoothing out the surface and adding details. And to add texture, he would use available tools um, such as emery boards or his barber clippers, um, as well as his handmade punches and stamps. And you can see some of those right here. These are his handmade tools. So having this, oops, just going a little overhead. Uh, so having this in mind, knowing a bit more about his uh, construction methods, uh, does that uh, change, you know, your perception of this piece? Um, these are, after all, the same techniques that he would use to create this sculpture. Well, Joshua, uh, this is Paula. Uh, one of the things, especially as you showed us his tools in the previous image, um, I can imagine, you know, perhaps him making those grooves with the chisel, you know, like the grooves at the top of this creature's head, and maybe even imagining, imagining like the emery board almost like sanding, you know, these, this texture. So, yes. yeah. Yeah, he definitely used these tools um, to create this skin texture, this kind of almost scaly-like effect. Um, I really wish I, I'm not much of a carver myself. I don't know the exact uh, mechanics of that, but these tools, let's see, I can go back. these would be used to create this kind of, this raised texture, um, adding this kind of detail. And yes, sometimes he would even use, as I said, his uh, barber clippers to uh, work on the wood particularly the hair of his portrait busts. And yes, uh, someone did know, yes, uh, this is a very small piece. It's only about, I think, six feet high or so. This is definitely towards the smaller end of his, uh, of the proportions of his work. So all this detail you're seeing close up is very, very much very small in real life. And for me, when I saw this piece, I first was struck by um, the resemblance between it and the traditional Chinese dragon, particularly the face. Um, and this uh, was not be too much of a stretch as Davis was a well-read man. Um, he spent a lot of his time reading at the library. 
Um, he would, you know, often read particularly about art. Uh, and uh, he often, uh, and as we've seen from his sculptures, he would, uh, you know, use influences from non-Western sources, including Asian ones. And in fact, we do have an example of that. Uh, one of his pieces was a statue of the Buddha. And so, so uh, you know, it's not impossible to me that he would have encountered such imagery while perusing an art history book, perhaps, or even maybe um, a National Geographic, as he really absorbed from both popular culture as well as, you know, more highbrow culture. And I also want to mention that, uh, going back to the, his, the face of the piece, this really kind of shows his decorative program. Um, so uh, Davis would often insert, insert found objects in works, and you can see that here. I'm not sure what those are, but his eyes look to be some kind of, you know, maybe buttons or maybe some kind of metal. Uh, Davis would use these. Um, he called them twinklets. This was um, object. These would have been, you know, rhinestones or pearls that he had gotten from his wife's broken jewelry or even some of her sequins from her dress. And he also would use house paint, especially in his earlier pieces. And later on, he did try to turn away from this as he really kind of developed an appreciation for the natural beauty of the grain. And sometimes he would take some of the pieces that he had done earlier and remove the paint. But throughout his life, even towards his death, some of his last pieces are still painted, sometimes, you know, in gold paint or other colors. Um, and he also, uh, interestingly, would use shoe polish a lot as a, a finish or a veneer, um, as this was a trick that he learned in his uh, furniture refinishing business. And so, but this, I believe, is paint. I have some more comments here. Oh, the eyes are sequins. Okay, yes. So this would, uh, yes, so that makes sense. It could, probably came from his wife's dress. All right. And so, yeah, I got a question. Is this one piece of wood? I have not seen this piece. Um, perhaps um, Jan can tell us that. Uh, but I do know that he would um, incorporate scrap wood for the appendages of his creatures, especially their legs or their tails. It seems like, yes, it looks like this one is one piece, though. Uh, but that is not a common trick that he would use when creating these sculptures. And when I saw this, I thought that it looked like, to me, um, to be almost like an uh, alligator tail. You know, Davis was from Savannah, so this is a semi-tropical environment. He would have been, either many, there are many alligators in the area, this would have been readily in his wheelhouse. Um, but they also could be, you know, perhaps a Nile crocodile. You know, as I said many times, Davis is a devout man. He read his Bible. He knew his Bible stories. And the bite in the Nile appears prominently in the story of Moses. And this was a biblical figure who held, was, it was deeply resonant um, for Davis and appeared throughout his art. And as we've seen by the 60s and 70s, um, he really began incorporating more and more um, African elements into his sculptures. And we don't really know the exact meanings of this, these, uh, these creatures. Um, perhaps they are just, you know, mainly meant to amuse Davis and his audience, or perhaps once again, they were a reflection of his faith. Several of the creatures reference Daniel, who, who um, in the Bible had a prophetic vision, which incorporated many fantastical beasts, um, some which were multi-headed, and you can see them here in a you know, 12th century, very much before Davis' time, of elimination, but even you know, looking at this, you can see how similar they are to some of his creatures, including the one you've seen so far. And these are generally thought as something dangerous, something to fear and respect. Um, but perhaps you know, uh, uh, but Davis's are really kind of cartoonish. They're almost hilariously pathetic. Um, and so perhaps you know, Davis's faith, you know, freed him from this fear, allowing him to uh, mock and ridicule them. Um, even turning them into objects of affection. And so here, once again, oh, here we are once again at the piece. And this really gives a, a good view of the entirety of the piece from the side. And yes, you can see here that it is you know, one piece on that pedestal. Um, and I want to open up, you know, open up the floor again for any comments or you know any uh, insights into the piece, any impressions. Any final passing thoughts about Davis? Hi, this is Christina. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hi, Christina. 
Hi, um, I just want to say that I think it's really impressive how I've seen this piece in, in person and the detail is really immaculate and I've never seen a photo of his tools and I'm super surprised because his tools look um, like he would have to handle this, uh, this piece of wood he was carving very, very delicately and with a sturdy hand. So it's very impressive uh, to see this again in uh, the same conversation as seeing his tools. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, and of course, yeah. And yeah, it really is remarkable, especially when you consider that he has been carving up to the day he died. He actually uh, had a heart attack while working on his final piece, which he considered his magnum opus. So he was, you know, he was carving throughout almost the entirety of his life and using these kinds of tools and creating this really very intricate kind of wood, wood carvings. All right, I think. Uh, hello. Master Carver, for sure. Hello. hello. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is Jan. Uh, I'm, you know, I live with this piece, and uh, you can't imagine uh, the details on that tail and the stippled sort of surface. And since he had, I uh, I learned something tonight. I didn't realize he had blacksmith training, which makes me wonder if he actually made his own tools. And that he might have made, uh, because uh, there's such delicate detail here that some of the tools for that kind of work he might have made himself as a blacksmith. Yes, some of the tools he did make. Yes, some tools he would attain. He, for example, go knife shopping in Atlanta, um, but the, he would then alter those for his needs. He would sometimes he would bend them um, and able to, you know, to create this very, these kind of elaborate, um, intricate designs. So even if he bought, even if he did buy something, he would sometimes alter it for his needs. But some pieces were completely, you know, created by him using those, those, uh, those, those, uh, a training that he had gotten as a blacksmith. All right, well, I guess we're coming to the end here. Um, and if we have, if anyone wants to learn more about uh, Davis, you can uh, perhaps, you know, maybe if you want to see some of his work when the world reopens, you can go to Savannah, Georgia. Um, you can go to the uh, Kingston um, Tisdale Cottage Foundation. Um, they are the ones who have the uh, bulk of his work as he was very insistent on having his work stay together as much as possible. And so you can go there and see, you know, um, I think three quarters of all of the art he created. Um, you can also go to the High Museum in Atlanta, which has the largest public collection outside of Savannah. Um, and you can also check out the book, um, the really invaluable book. I used it throughout my research um, by Sarah Mitchell Crawley, and that's The Treasure of Ulysses Davis. And also in 2019, um, a Davis uh, documentary was released, and that was entitled Visions of, Uly of Ulysses Davis. So I yeah, hope this, you know, perhaps inspired a desire to learn more. Uh, did you do any research on his zodiac themes? Zodiac themes? I uh, did not see those. I um, I would not be surprised. Those those themes I gave were not uh, definitely by any means not a comprehensive list of themes. There are other ones as well, but those are kind of the bulk of his different works. I think that that there are definitely themes that don't you know the pieces that don't fit into these um, pre-described themes. And yes, I do believe I think I do believe the treasure of Lizzie Davis, the book that the, the show that this book I've been using came out of that did come to um, into it. And this is the book catalog I've been mentioning. All right. And Phil, I'm not sure um, if he did use kind of took advantage of the natural curve of the wood there. Um, that's something that he would do. He would really make sure that the he would really sit with a piece of wood before he decided to carve it. Uh, he wanted to make sure he had the absolute perfect um, you know, uh, theme or subject matter for a specific piece of wood. So he would sometimes let a piece sit for five years, coming back to it um, throughout that time. All right, well, it looks like that's the end of uh, our, our discussion almost. I don't want to go, I don't want people from eating. Yeah, uh, thank you so Any much, Joshua. Uh, sorry, I'm talking over you. 
Uh, yeah, any last questions while we have Joshua here? Uh, I feel like this is this was my introduction to Ulysses Davis. And um, I one thing I do want to say that I really loved when we first talked about this is um, how your connection to Georgia really influenced uh, your selection of this piece. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Davis is not terribly known outside of Georgia, even though he should be. He's really a master carver, one of the greatest, uh, you know, self-taught or not, and of the South. And uh, the fact that he really wanted to keep his work together kind of has led him to not be so well known as it's almost in one place, in one city in Savannah. And otherwise, you know, there's not species to express out museums um, and galleries such as someone like Howard Finster. Um, who is much well more well known. Okay. All right, well, everyone, thank you for coming to One Night Stand. We'll see you again next month. Uh, we will have Art After Work in May and also another installment of One Night Stand. And I hope you have a really great night. And we hope to see you around into it if you are in the Chicago area or visiting sometime this summer. Bye.